Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study as we come to the last lesson in the book of Galatians and it will be the last lesson and as Paul uh, finishes the letter, his letter, he will be a little bit more personal with the Galatians. So I've titled this lesson, Paul's Personal Postscript. Uh, and uh, we begin in verse 11 and Paul says, you see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. <laughs> for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, <coughs> peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So, uh, what a... What an ending in this, in this book. And the first thing you will notice in verse 11 is that Paul tells the Galatians that he wrote the letter himself and he wrote a large letter. So we have stated previously that uh, it is very likely, and I, I believe this position and I hold to this position. Why? Because based on the evidence within the, the, the Word of God, that Paul had a problem with his eyes. And uh, this is evidenced by verse 11. He tells them that he wrote a large letter. Now, if you study the Pauline epistles, if you uh, peruse them through the scriptures, you will see that the book of Galatians is not his longest epistle. In fact, uh, Romans is longer, uh, 1 Corinthians is longer, 2 Corinthians is longer, and Hebrews is longer. So the book of Galatians, or the epistle to the Galatians, is not Paul's longest letter. So, uh, after... When we began the lesson in the book of Galatians, we mentioned the fact that the epistle to the Galatians was the first epistle that Paul wrote. And uh, this, to me, this cements this belief because Paul says in this letter explicitly that he wrote it himself. And we know after this letter that Paul no longer wrote the letters himself, but he used a scribe or what we call an amanuensis. That means somebody who writes on your behalf. Uh... And you can see that in 1 Corinthians 16, 21, in Colossians 4, 18, in 2 Thessalonians 3, 17. Uh, when all the letters were ended, Paul would actually pen a sentence or two uh, to authenticate the letter and to prove that he indeed was writing a letter. Uh, he, he would put down, um, let's see if I have one here, uh, with my own hand. Uh, for example, Romans 16, 22. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. In other words, Tertius wrote the epistle of Romans. Did he actually write the epistle? He wrote the words. He wrote the words. Paul dictated to him. In 2 Thessalonians 3.17, Paul says, The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is the token in every epistle. Now, is that the case? Think about that for a moment. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3.17, that the token of every epistle is a greeting that he places there personally with his own hand. Is that the case? Every letter. Well, it must be because Correct. But which epistle breaks the mold? Galatians breaks the mold because he wrote the entire letter on his own. So after you do a job and it becomes difficult, really, really difficult, what do you usually do? You get someone to help you. You know, so sometimes when you start repairing your car and you take it all apart and you, you scratch your head and you say, okay, why do I have more screws than I started with? You're going to ask for some help. So this to me proves further proof, further evidence that the book of Galatians was indeed the first uh, letter that Paul wrote. If you look at the New Testament, you will see that the letters of Paul uh, start, are listed or um, begin after the book of Acts and they are arranged in order of length I don't know if you've ever noticed that but all of Paul's epistles except for Hebrews 
because people debate the, who actually wrote the book of Hebrews. I personally believe it was Paul based on the internal evidence of the book and the, the incredible amount of Old Testament scriptures that Paul actually quoted in the book, just as he did with Romans and other epistles. So I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, but there's debate among some, uh, some people whether that is the case or not. But regardless, the rest of the letters of Paul in the Bible are ordered in beginning from longest to shortest. So what is Paul's longest epistle, excluding Hebrews? Romans. Romans. So you'll find Romans after the book of Acts. What is Paul's shortest epistle? Philemon. Philemon. And Philemon is the last one read before Hebrews, correct? So you'll see that the letters, Paul's letters in the New Testament are ordered from longest to shortest. And Galatians makes it after uh, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. So by stating that Paul endeavored to write this letter tells us that he was really concerned with what was going on in the church of Galatia. And he wrote a large letter. Why do you think Paul would write a large letter? It wasn't a large letter, but he wrote a large letter. What would make him write a large letter? Think about this. Because he, he was writing in big letters because he couldn't see too well. So what, how do kids write when they first learn how to write? They write really big letters. They write the word cat and it takes up the whole page. And I'm not saying that's what Paul did, but he makes it here that he wrote a large letter because he couldn't see too well. In fact, we mentioned this in a previous lesson. In Galatians 4.15, Paul says, Where is then the blessedness he spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. It's further evidence that Paul had problems with his eyes. Uh, the funniest comment I read about this is as follows. And again, these commentators, uh, they make these comments, and I wondered if they've ever read the Bible. Uh, you've never read the Bible first before you start commenting on the Bible. One guy says this: most commentators consider that he used large letters deliberately. I almost fell out of my chair. He used large letters deliberately, either because he was teasing his readers like children, rebuking their spiritual maturity by using baby writing, or simply for emphasis. I'm like, you have to get the. If you have a degree, you have to get a refund. Sorry, sir. But uh, Paul was determined to write to the Galatians, and he was upset what was going on there. You know, sometimes when uh, you ask somebody to do a job, and uh, they don't do it, you say, I'll do it myself, or I'll call him myself. Well, Paul is just like that. He was so upset with what was going on. He says, I'm going to write the letter myself. I'm not going to wait for a scribe. I'm not going to wait for a menwensis. I'm just going to sit there. I'm gonna, I, don't, I know I'm going to struggle through the letter, but I'm going to write it myself. And we mentioned the fact of other epistles where that is no longer the case. Uh, now, when we look at uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 11, and every once in a while, because this is a Bible study, I do mention the uh, translation issues, because I think as Christians we should be aware of those, because you're going to see some blowhard, and he's going to come to you and he's going to say, Oh, uh, uh, the King James is not really a literal translation, because... Uh, Galatians 6 11 it should be translated as see with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand uh, but we have to understand sometimes when you're translating from one language to another uh, you either use what's called a formal equivalence or a dynamic equivalence formal equivalence is when you translate it as literally as possible and dynamic equivalence is you take a little bit of liberty with the wording because it really doesn't make sense when you translate from one language to the other. And sometimes uh, my, my kids are learning Greek, uh, and I, 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 they laugh because I said, well, uh, literally in Greek it would be, uh, and I give them the Greek sentence, a literal translation, and they laugh because they think it's funny. And that's the case with, with many languages. You can't really directly translate from one language to the other. So the issue I have is these people who accuse uh, the King James here of using dynamic equivalents, they're hypocrites because they do it elsewhere in the scriptures, but it's, it's, <clears throat> it's okay when they do it, but what, not when the King James translators have done it. One person said this, and I find this uh, farcical, the NIV is the most popular evangelical translation. It attempts to find an optimal balance between exactness, 
formal equivalence and readability dynamic equivalence. I don't agree with that statement, by the way, because I think it's uh, they've taken so much liberty with the Word of God that they've actually messed it up in more places than I can count. Uh, but anyways, I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, but Paul is basically saying, I wrote a long letter because it was tough for me to write and I wanted to write to you. I'm taking the time to do this uh, because I want you to know how concerned I am and I couldn't wait any longer to find anyone to help me write this letter. Uh, in the end, he commends, he, and he, he also says to them, as, he, as he's writing to them, and he keeps bringing this point up, uh, he always brings up those who are pushing circumcision. And he ends his letter and he, he reminds the Galatians, uh, I want to remind you that those who are pushing circumcision are doing so, and the words that he uses are, they want, they desire to make a fair show in the flesh. So what does that mean? They wanted to make a fair show in the flesh. Well, they wanted to get the Galatian Christians back into the law. They wanted to get them circumcised so they can go around and brag as, you see, look how many people we converted today. Look how many people we saved today. Look how many people we circumcised today. Because when they do such, such things, they can go around bragging how true their doctrine is. And many times churches with great numbers uh, have this issue and they say, well, we must be doing something right. Look at how many thousands of people we have in the church. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason you have thousands of people in the church is because you do not preach against sin and the people feel comfortable with their sin when they come to your church. Uh, that, it's a sad state of affairs today in Christianity. When you preach to Christians what they must do, you offend them. When you tell them they must be in church, they must read, they must pray, they must give, they must witness, they must live right, they must live holy, uh, and on and on and on you go, they, they, they can't handle these things. Because there's too many of them that they don't do and they can't handle it. So they, they, they don't come to the church, they want to find someone who tickles their ears. Does not the Bible say that's what's going to happen in the end times? Does it not say that? They will find teachers who, who tickle or who with itching ears. They want, to, they want the ears to be tickled. They want to hear what they want to hear. We have a lot of apologists today in Christianity. They debate, they argue, they write books. Uh, they're looking for the aha moment. I'm not against this, but I'm not going to debate an atheist. You know what I'm going to tell an atheist? Ye must be born again. I'm not going to debate a Bible denier. I'm going to tell him, you must be born again. Unless he has a Spirit of God, how do you think he's going to change? Unless the Holy Spirit convicts him that he's wrong, how is he going to change? You can debate with him all day long. I've done it. It's work. I've never yet had a, a co-worker. I work with engineers. Come to me and say, you know what? I think I'm thinking about I'm rethinking my stance on evolution. No. Unless the Holy Spirit convicts them that they are a sinner on the way to hell, you may have success with that, but I, I don't see... Uh, these people waste their breath sometimes. If God has called you to do that, uh, go for it. But uh, I've learned in life and I've lived long enough to tell you that sometimes you just waste your breath. You've got to tell them, look, you believe we came from monkeys, that's okay. Are you saved? Are you saved? Are you going to heaven or are you going to hell? That's what we should focus on. Uh, both Peter and Paul tell us that we ought to defend and be able to reason that Christ was to live, die, and be buried from, from the dead. We have to be ready to defend our faith. But to sit there and argue whether the uh, sky is green or blue or red, Sometimes you just waste your breath. Look what Paul did in Acts 17, 2, verse 3. Now, why am I bringing this in? Because uh, you'll see that at the end of the letter, Paul gets to the point where he says, you know what? I've done all I can. Don't bother me anymore with this stuff. He's reached his limit. He tried really hard with this letter to the Galatians, and he says, you know, I'm telling you what it should be. If you want to follow grace, that's fine. If you don't want to follow grace... I don't want to hear anymore. I'm done with you guys. And we're going to get to that towards the end of the letter. So uh, sometimes you reach that point with a lot of people. And uh, uh, look what Paul did when he, when he witnessed the people. Did he debate uh, whether the Romans should be in power or not? Did he debate whether we should wear blue clothes or green clothes? No, look, look, look what he did in Acts 17, 2 and 3. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. That's what we should focus on. We should focus on Christ. When I meet a lost person and say, are you, 
But when I meet a, a Muslim, I don't debate whether my Bible is right or his Quran is right. I say, uh, Jesus Christ said, if you don't believe in him, you're going to hell. Blah, blah, blah. I don't care you blah, blah, blah. Do you Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? It's the only way to get to heaven. Yes, but no. Have you done that? That's what you focus on. You focus on Christ. And you make them face the most important question, and that is whether or not they have accepted or, or received Christ as their Savior. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your heart, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of why you don't believe uh, in evolution. No. That asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. What is that hope in us? What is this hope in me and you? What is it? Christ. Christ is in me. Christ is in you if you're a born again Christian. That is the hope. And that's what we have to tell people. There's a danger in debating non Christ topics. You got to be careful when you're debating someone because you can get sucked into a trap. Someone said, uh, be careful that you don't debate a fool because they'll bring you down to the level and beat you with their, with their ignorance, with their experience. After being a Christian for a long time and dealing with many people, I have to come to the, I have come to the conclusion that my job is simply to tell them the truth and what the Bible says, and then let the Holy Spirit do His job. Let Him convict them. And let Him show them the error of the ways. I am not going to get bent out of shape. Sometimes I do get bent out of shape, but I shouldn't, because in Second Timothy two twenty four, Paul says to. Timothy, and the servant of the Lord must not strive. You see that? The servant of the Lord must not strive. You know what that means? Don't get into fights. But be gentle. Be gentle unto all men. Apt to teach. Patient. So that tells me, if I'm going to have a discussion with you, and I'm going to see you start yelling at me, I'm not going to yell even louder. I'm just going to say, Sir, I... See, we have reached an impasse, and let us agree to disagree. Have a nice day. Because my words are not going to change that man's heart. Now, through the Word of God, they will. But I'm not going to waste my breath with someone who doesn't want to, wants to beat me over the head. I will not do it. I will teach and preach what the Lord wants me to. I'll tell you what the Lord expects from you. And then it's up to you to obey or to disobey. And you know what the thing about that is? Uh, there's no stress on me. Because one day, you will have to give an account to the Lord yourself. You're going to be alone before Christ. If you're a Christian, you're going to be alone before Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. And you will have to give an account of what you've done for Christ. It no, no skin off my back. You're the one that's going to lose the rewards, not me. You're, sorry, you're the one that's going to lose your rewards. And likewise, the lost person. You witness to them about Christ. And if they don't want to hear it, you pray for them, you try to compel them in gentleness and meekness. You say, look, I please, you got to get saved. And if they don't want to hear you, they are the ones that are going to stand before the white throne judgment and give an account to God. And you will see that in the end, in verse 17, we're going to touch on that in a moment. That is the attitude that Paul adopts with the Galatians. Legalists will often pretend to be motivated by concern over you. Because they want to bring you under their form of doctrine, under their form of worship. Uh, that's how cults work. They come and they pretend they care. They pretend they're concerned. They pretend they get involved in your life. Just all they were looking for is for you to join their movement. But Paul saw through this deception of the legalists. And he saw that their motive was selfish. They simply wanted to bask in their self-glory. To say, hey, look how many converts we had. Look how many people are following us. Uh, God must be on our side. The majority report is always wrong. Now Christ made it clear that those who will find the truth are few. Narrow is the way. Broad is the gate that leads to destruction. So you hear many, and I, we, I have this debate with many Christians today. You hear a lot of people say, uh, they go to church, yeah, I'm saved. Are you really saved? You're not showing any evidence of salvation. Doesn't the Bible say you become a new creature? And we'll get into that in a moment. Doesn't he say that once you receive Christ, all things will become old? 
and you are now a new creature, that your mind is different, that your uh, affections are different. When I see a Christian and he, has, he or she has no concerns for the things of God, you wonder, have they been really saved or they think they're saved? You ask yourself. Sometimes uh, I see myself and uh, I'm teaching and preaching and I get into this trap and, and, and many pastors get into this trap. They say, I'm teaching the Bible. I try not to give my opinion. I'm trying to give the congregation meat. I'm trying to uh, prepare and be always prepared, not wing it. And, and I hate preachers that wing it. And, and you say, well, well, where is everybody? Why aren't they concerned? Why don't they care? And it, and it starts bothering you. But then in the end, you know what? Uh, my responsibility is to simply to teach you the Word of God, to preach you the Word of God. And what you do with that is up to you. Yeah. I can't make you do the things of God. I can make my children until they're under my roof. Those are the only people that I can make do things. But the rest, it's going to be between you and God. And we should never wear our church members or other Christians as a badge of honor. Only God deserves this. And I see a lot of Christians and they follow Joel Osteen and they follow Creflo Dollar, all these people of the world, the modern day Judaizers, I call them. Uh, and if you want to follow them, that's right. That's okay with you. They'll never say anything bad to you. They always want to tell you how, uh, how to feel good, that God wants the best for you and God wants to bless you. So whenever they say God wants to bless you, what do you think they have in mind? What? Money. Money, because that's what the Christian wants today. Uh, th this branch of Christianity uh, promises a good life and prosperity and lots of money. God is going to, you just do what God tells you to do and God's going to bless you beyond your wildest imaginations. Uh, God's blessings will pour upon you like water from heaven and you'll be of uh, never having anything wanting and your coffers are going to be full and the Christians just lick it up. They just lick it up. Yes, send me some seed money, and God will multiply your gift. It's a dis deception, and uh, they appeal to a Christian's greed. It's, 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 it's incredible. And Paul also gives us an additional motive of the Judaizers beyond their self-glory, and that was they wanted to avoid being, uh, they wanted to avoid suffering persecution. So how would how would they be? How would they avoid suffering persecution? So let me let me share let me tell you to let me tell it to you this way. Uh, if these legalists, instead of trying to bring the Galatians under the law, had said, "We are saved like just like what Paul preached, we are saved only by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ," uh, what do you think would have happened to them? The Jews would have persecuted them just like they persecuted Paul. So uh, there are some people in our world today, even Christians, they are not willing to stand up for what's right uh, because they don't want to be persecuted. I remember one time uh, Joel Osteen was, uh, was being interviewed in a talk show host and they asked him, is Christ the only way to heaven? And he says, well, uh, I don't know, but uh, I believe that is wrong. He was afraid of being persecuted. I remember that interview, just like yesterday. Uh, he should have said, yes, the Bible is very clear that the only way to God, the only way to heaven, is through Jesus Christ. Regardless of what a persecution you would receive, you have to tell the truth. But uh, people are unwilling to stand up for the truth because they're afraid of the persecution that will follow. And I'm telling you, my friend, that is wrong. Yeah. You are more willing to adopt false doctrine for self-preservation. Now I'm going to give you an example here, and I know it may upset you, some of you. But just, just bear with me for a minute. I want to show you that this world is built on self-deception. Now we know that the COVID pandemic is pretty much out. But when it rolled out, do you know how many doctors, how many doctors went out and told people what they must do to protect themselves? I listened to these doctors. They even had a website. But you know what happened? They were silenced. One of these doctors is in jail right now. And I talked to doctor friends of mine who work at the hospital. I said, hey, why don't, you, why don't you guys give these medicines to the people? And you know the answer I was told? If we do, that we're going to lose our license and we're going to get fired. Why, why, is, why is this deception? It's not only in medicine. It's in, it's in energy. It's in your personal finances. It's in insurance. This deception is every. It's in, within our politicians. 
deception is everywhere. And I've actually watched some clips from the Russian media. And these people talk about uh, what their government is doing and how great it is, how great their leader is. And they talk about it with such, such enthusiasm and ask myself, do they actually believe the lies that they're saying? Now, why am I telling you this? Because there are there's going to be preachers out there who are going to appeal to your desire to feel good, to your desire to want more, your desire for greed. They're going to appeal to you and they're going to deceive you. And why am I telling you this? Because the Bible says that's what's going to happen in the end times. Deception is going to be rampant. In medicine, there's deception. There's deception everywhere. And I'm going to tell you, as God is my witness, if you want the truth, God will bring you the truth. Where, what is with, with whatever disease. Now, the next thing, the next pandemic is in the process. Monkeypox. I don't know if you guys have been watching that. More deception is going to come up. Why? Because they want us to be afraid. They want us to be under their control. And the Judaizers wanted the same thing from the Galatians. So they wanted to control them by telling them, hey, uh, this grace by faith stuff is wrong. You gotta get circumcised, you gotta come under the law. And the Bible tells us in 2 Thessalonians 2.11, at the last days, for this cause, what cause, they did not want to believe the truth, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So who's going to send the delusion? What does the Bible say? God will, God himself is going to give them a lie that they're going to want to believe. You say, would God do such a thing? Would God allow me to believe a lie? If your heart is not right with him, you better believe he will let you believe a lie. And will he do that to Christians? How many isms and schisms are there out there right now? Why so many Christian denominations? You think they're all right? No. The reason why there's so many denominations is because someone wants to show you that they're right and you're wrong, therefore believe my way or, or the highway. If you want to believe a lie and deceive yourself, God will let you. I have learned that from the scriptures. If you want to believe a lie and deceive yourself, God will let you. There's so many religious hypocrites. These Judaizers, Paul, Paul calls them religious hypocrites. Why? Because they wanted everyone else to obey the law, but Paul makes it clear that they themselves did not obey the law. We have our politicians. They pass laws. Do you know that many laws, they, they actually put in the law that they're exempt from this law? Paul points out to the hypocrisy of the legalists, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law. You cannot get more blunt than this. Hey, Galatians, the people you're following, the hypocrites. We saw many politicians who passed these laws. Uh, you know, you have to social distance, you have to wear a mask, you have to do this. And they themselves are partying. You know, that in, in, uh, in England, the, the prime minister was kicked out. You know why he was kicked out? Because he violated every single COVID law that he himself signed. So they kicked him out. Hypocrites. It's not only in politics. It's with religious leaders also. And then Paul warns the Galatians, they're wanting you under the law, but be careful, they themselves don't keep the law. And the Bible is very clear, no one can keep the law. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Most denominations who teach you that you can lose your salvation, they themselves have a hard time keeping the law. I wonder how many times they have lost their salvation. I grew up in a church like that, and I know it, I've seen it. I was taught when I was a kid, the church I went to, my mom struggled with this a lot. She was, my mom was so terrified of losing her salvation because the preacher of the church taught that, hey, if you're not right with God, you're going to lose your salvation. It terrified her. Jeremy Taylor said, whoever is a hypocrite in his religion mocks God, presenting to him the outside and reserving the inward for his enemy. Andre Giri said, the true hypocrite is the one who ceases to perceive his deception and the one who lies with sincerity. And you know one thing that, I, and again, I'm not saying this to brag about myself or to boast, but even as a child, even as a teenager, I never wanted to be deceived. I said, Lord, please give me the truth. They give me the truth even if I don't like it. So I used to go to churches and I would hear the preachers and they would say things, and they would they were mean, they were loud, they were obnoxious. But you know what? I didn't care. Because you know what I wanted? 
I wanted the truth. I didn't care if it hit me like a two by four across the head. I didn't care. I just wanted the truth. Someone said, the church is not full of hypocrites. There's always room for more. <laughs> so I knew someone who used to me, I don't want to go to church. I said, why? The church is full of hypocrites. I said, at least they go to church. Someone really close to me years ago. The preachers Paul was calling out may have preached the cross as part of their salvation, but they were adding things to it. They were adding the circumcision. The, way, the reason why Paul says they were doing this is because they didn't want the Jews to tell them, we're not teaching contrary to the law of Moses. Hey, we're not telling the people they shouldn't be circumcised. We're not telling them they should keep the law. And that was the accusation the Jews had against Paul. In Acts 21, 21, the Bible says, And they are informed of thee, that is Paul, that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to, not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. So they were basically accusing Paul of teaching they shouldn't follow Moses. Was, was that what Paul was teaching? No, Paul wasn't teaching that. What was Paul teaching? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That the law is no longer in play right now. That now that Christ has come and died on the cross for our sins, we must believe in him now. He never told them not to get circumcised. In fact, what did he do to Timothy? He circumcised them. Or was it uh, someone? Yeah, Timothy. That's right. He had Timothy circumcised so the Jews wouldn't complain. So Paul never taught you shouldn't get circumcised. Paul never taught you shouldn't follow the law of Moses. But what he taught was that the law was no longer necessary. Christ has now come. So he is the way to, to righteousness. And you didn't have to get circumcised for That's right. You didn't have to get circumcised for salvation like the Jews taught. Paul, Paul's heart only cared for the cross. He didn't boast in his efforts. He didn't boast in his converts. He cared for... Uh, he cared nothing for the glory that came from riches. He cared nothing for the glory that came from status and power among men. He cared only for the glory of the cross of Christ. We preach Christ. And I know sometimes, sometimes I give you my, my opinion on some things. And I'm careful to tell you it's my opinion. Because I believe that the most important thing is the cross of Christ. That's the only thing that matters. Nothing else matters. Politics don't matter. Finances don't matter. Uh, what's going on in Russia and Ukraine don't matter. What matters is, have you trusted Christ as your Savior? That's the only thing that matters. And of all of our accomplishments, everything that you do pales in comparison with, with what Christ did on the cross. And the only thing that you and I should glory is that we have been saved by the finished work of Christ on the cross. And the only thing that we should glory is to glory on the one who died for me and on the one who died for you. That's the only thing we should boast about. In 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, Paul says, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Regarding the cross, Spurgeon says, What did he mean, however, by the cross? Of course he cared nothing for the particular piece of wood to which those blessed hands and feet were nailed. For that was mere materialism, and has perished out of mind. He means the glorious doctrine of justification, free justification through the atoning sacrifice <coughs> of Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you here this evening, that I say a lot of things that may upset you, a lot of things maybe that I shouldn't say, but I know one thing that I should say, that if every Christian would fall in love with their Savior, all of the church's problems would go away. So before we go on to the next verse, I want to give you several aspects of the cross that we also covered in Lesson 7. The believer is crucified with Christ positionally. That is, when Christ died on the cross, every person who was to be saved died with him. And we can't understand that. That is a spiritual doctrine. Galatians 2.20 says this. Uh, Christ himself was crucified on the cross in the past. So those people say, oh, can God forgive me of my sins? He already forgave the whole world of their sins on the cross. He's already done that. You just have to now receive that forgiveness 
but is available to you. Number three, our flesh must be crucified on the cross daily. And the reason why some Christians do not live a victorious Christian life is they have not understood how to do that. And number four, the world is crucified to the believer. For now the world should be dead to us and lies under the wrath of God. I'll give you a couple of references here. Galatians 6, 14, 2 Peter 3, 7 through 10. The world should not have any influence over you and I if we consider it dead. John Trapp said, The world and I are well agreed. The world cares not a pin for me, and I care as little for the world. That should be our attitude as Christians. I should be, we should be focused on Christ. We talk about the things of the world. Yes, we do, because we're human beings. We talk about uh, current, of, current events. We talk about politics, we talk about our health, we talk about food, we talk about A, B, C, D, but those things should pale in comparison with our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you'll see here in, uh, in verse, verse uh, where is it? The world is crucified with me. And well, verse 14, Paul says, by whom the world is crucified unto me. The world is crucified unto me. Now, if you have a modern version, they will have said, the world has been crucified. And it's dangerous to translate, it is crucified to as has been crucified, because that means that the struggle with the world is past. And that's not the case. The world has not been crucified. The world is crucified. That is, every day, you and I should crucify the world on the cross of Christ. Our battle with the world will not end until God calls us home. Our battle with the flesh will not end until God calls us home. And Christ makes it clear, uh, sorry, Paul makes it clear again in verse 15 that only Christ matters. For he says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision but a new creature. Paul is basically saying it doesn't matter if you're uncircumcised. It doesn't, ma it doesn't matter if you're circumcised. What matters is, are you born again? Have you received Christ as your Savior? Have you become a new creature in Christ? In 2 Corinthians 5.17, Paul says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, I've, I bring this up whenever necessary, and I think it's necessary because of what's going on in modern Christianity. It's typical for modern versions to mess up cardinal doctrines. What are these cardinal doctrines? These are doctrines that you cannot compromise on. You may believe some things about the Bible that we call gray areas, but a cardinal doctrine is something that you will die on. For example, I believe that Jesus Christ is God. God in the flesh. He came in the flesh. These are cardinal doctrines. I will not change these doctrines. Not even if my life depended on it. I believe that salvation is by faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. That's a cardinal doctrine. I will not change this. And verse, four, verse 15 has been butchered by pretty much almost every new version. Check it out. Galatians 6.15. It does matter which version version you use for the expression in Christ Jesus has been completely removed and new creature has been translated as new creation. We are not a new creation in Christ. We are a new creature because we still hold on to what? The flesh. This flesh that we have, we still have it. The moment you and I got saved, we didn't get rid of this flesh. So we are a new creature, not a new creation. We still have to carry this body until we are reunited with the Lord. Very different between saying we are a new creature versus we are a new creation. And in fact, the first verse 15, in Christ Jesus has been completely removed. I just want to share that with you. Paul now appeals to the fact that he bears the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 17. So what does he mean he bears the mark of the Lord Jesus Christ? Did Paul get crucified? No. 
Uh, Paul was a man who was persecuted and he was beaten, he was whipped, he was stoned, and all these things that he endured for Christ left scars on him, left marks on him. Just like the Lord, uh, after he was uh, uh, crucified, he had marks on his body. Remember, his back was plowed, the Bible says, uh, his face in the book of Isaiah, the Bible says that they plucked his beard. Think about that. Any one of any of you have facial hair? Have you ever tried to pull some of your facial hair? See how painful it is. The Bible says they plucked the beard of Christ, and after they were done, he was unrecognizable. You, you looked upon him, and you say, "Is that Jesus? He doesn't look like him. He was bruised and swollen, and blood dripping all over him. He had the thorn of crowns on his head." His, uh, the, the crown of thorns on his head, not the thorn of crowns on his head. Make sure you guys are paying attention. Paul says, I bear the marks. And if anyone has a right to brag, it's me. I can brag because I bear the marks of Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, I have suffered so much for the cause of Christ that it's no one can compare to me. But he, yet he doesn't brag about this. He brags only on Christ. The only people in Galatia Paul had no qualms with were those who had the same mindset that only Christ matters. I know sometimes you talk about controversial topics, but in the end I have to tell you these things don't matter. The only thing that matters is Jesus Christ, that he saved me and that I now serve him. And for you Christian, you have to have the same mindset. The only thing that should matter is the fact that Christ saved you and what are you doing for him now? When we witness to the lost, we must, we must main, we must remain on the main question, which is, are you born again? You can argue all kinds of stuff; it doesn't really matter. Bottom line is, are you saved? Have you received Christ as your savior? Just as Christ told Nicodemus. Nicodemus was saying, oh, you are great, you're wonderful, Lord, you come from God, you did all these miracles. And what did Christ say? Are you born again, Nicodemus? You See, he went right to the point. He went right to the most important topic. And he tells Nicodemus, ye must be born again. That means all of you must be born again. That's what matters. To Paul understood that. And Paul says to me, only the Christ matters. And in verse 16, I love the expression, and we need to talk a little bit about that. He uses this unique expression called the Israel of God. Paul here is not referring to the physical Israel, but he is referring to the spiritual Israel. He is referring to those who have come to Christ, Christ, as, Christ as Savior. He is making reference to Galatians 3.7 when he says, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. He's talking about the spiritual offspring of God. Now, Paul is not advocating replacement theology, and we covered this in Lesson 8 and 9. He's not referring to the Jewish people who have trusted Christ as his Messiah, for he stated in verse 15, he's talking about the circumcision and the uncircumcision. It's simply, uh, Paul is using this expression, the Israel of God, to refer to spiritual, the spiritual offspring of Abraham. He's not dismissing physical Israel, but he's referring to the spiritual offspring of Abraham. Uh, of God. He's simply identifying believers as the Israel of God. So when you read your commentary, keep that in mind. Don't anyone dissuade you and make you uh, believe this false doctrine called replacement theology. So now we have come to the end of the, of the, um, of the letter. And these are the last words of Paul in this epistle to the Galatians. He says, from henceforth, let no man trouble me. Don't bother me. For I bear the marks, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Paul poured out his heart to the Galatians, writing to them out of great concern. He is telling them, as he concludes this letter, if you want to know whether I am real, if you want to know whether I mean what I say and I believe what I tell you, all you have to do is examine my body. Look at my marks. Remember, uh, Doubting Thomas, they told him, Hey, Thomas, the Lord rose from the dead. Uh, I don't believe you. But he did. We saw him. I don't believe you. Unless I see the marks on his body. And then what happened after that? Eight days later, Jesus appeared to Thomas 
and in John 20, 27, and he says to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but believing. Likewise, Paul is telling the Galatians, if you really want to know whether I mean business, if you really want to know whether I'm a real apostle, if you really want to know whether my doctrine is real, I'll come and examine the marks on my body. And you'll know that why did I go through all these things if I didn't believe what I was teaching and preaching was the truth. He basically ends the book by telling the Galatians, I don't want to hear any more criticism of my ministry from men who don't know what they are talking about. If you think circumcision is a big deal, I'll show you some real marks. Come and see the marks on my body. Do not brag about your circumcision. And Paul concludes this rich epistle by commending the brethren to the grace of God. The teaching in the scripture is clear. We are saved by grace through faith alone in Christ. We are kept by grace. We continue by grace. And when we need grace, God gives it to us. And when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, guess what? The God will give us the grace. God said, my grace, right, is sufficient for thee. God gives us grace to be saved. That's We're saved by his grace. And life, the Christian life, is to be lived by the grace of God. So we have come to the end of the book of Galatians. I have enjoyed the study to be honest with you and uh, next week we will start a new series uh, a rather shorter series on where do the dead go so if there are no quick questions or comments we will end the lesson this evening and hopefully we will see you same time same place next week